All right, we are now live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to OnCon 6. Good to see you all. Um, as you might guess, because there are other, yeah, people are moving back and forth. We actually have folks here with us for OnCon 6, which is really exciting. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, hey, Philippa, good to see you. Um, yeah, we're going to uh, dig in now here in just a minute with our first panel. So uh, this should be a lot of fun. We are starting with uh, a panel on Makoto Shinkai, am I right? Yeah. Yes. Good, yes. <laughs> hey, you know, we're professionals here. Um, so yeah, um, let's, start, let's just dig right in. This is a panel focus con. Let's get to the panels. So uh, let's, let us switch over. Um, you guys want to grab a, a chair or whatever, bring that in, and um, we will move over to that panel. Um, you guys want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah. Yeah. I, hi, my name is Justin Cole. I'm a uh, panelist uh, who's been doing panels uh, since about 2015 uh, for Anime USA. I'm still adjusting to the online panel scene. Uh, I think this is my first time on camera doing one of these, although we did one a long time, like when mm -hmm. Pandemic first started. Yep. Uh, and then feel free. Pandemic has been a long time, folks. Yep, sure has. Um, Hi, I'm Yuki Shiro, uh, also known as Alan Decora La Souza. I've been paneling, doing this panel with uh, Justin Cole uh, for some years now. Yeah, I yeah. want to say like I, we lose, we lost track, and like I think it was, I, I started in like 2014, and then yeah. I think we I pulled him on to do this in like 2016 or 2017. Cool. All right, let us get started. I will switch over to the presentation. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and go to it. Happen. Um, so let's switch over here. Oh, that's the thing. Okay, hold on, hold on. I see what's going on. Um, so I think we need to switch over. It would help, I think, if there was an actual microphone in that scene. Um, that might change things. So let me switch over back over to the presentation. Okie doke. Um, so there is now a microphone switched on on here, which you can see down there, okay. which I forgot to turn on. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. So that's audio probably pickup is there or there? Um, audio pickup is here, Excellent. this microphone here. Um, and that should be now true for the rest of the con. Yeah. 
Okay. So that should be just a setting that we, we have set up. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, you guys get to hear our beautiful voices. Exactly. Can you all hear us now? We'll just double check. Chat's always a bit, a bit um, yeah. delayed. Um, um, but we're not hearing people saying that we, they can't hear us. So okay. that is a good well, sign. People, so, people saying that you can't hear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, so let us know if there are any issues or not. Um, and we will otherwise um, uh, assume we're good and we will continue going. Um, so, you, yep. Okay, it looks like we're good. Okay. All right. Cool. Great. All right. Well, yep. Let's just jump right back into yep. it like nothing ever happened. Right. Um, Hi, I'm Yukishiro, also known as Alan Corla Souza. This is uh, Justin they, Cole. They heard the introduction oh, because the, the microphone was live in the other scene, but oh, not okay. this scene. Um, so what you didn't hear is that uh, this uh, this this panel is an uh, overview of Shinkai and the techniques he mm -hmm. uses, uh, and that while he was well known before your name, he is was not the same level of uh, super famous that he is now. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of newer viewers to Shinkai that came in with your name and potentially weathering with you uh, aren't aware of some of his older filmography. Yeah. And there's there's a bit of a reason for that as we go through this panel. We'll be kind of weaving together his uh, his biographical information, his filmography, and his growth in directorial and animation techniques as they kind of all grow together. Um, and there's a kind of a reason he went from... And he's still a young director, so there's a reason he went from unknown to niche to now kind of uh, uh, a big name, uh, a household name, uh, after after your name. So I think this is a, a panel specifically that Alan likes to talk about. Yes. Uh, well, um, I like to focus a little more on the technicals, and um, I'm sure some artists will know a lot more than I do, um, but even from an appreciation standpoint, this won't be hard to understand, and you even if you have no technical background, you would be able to understand how he's composing um, his, uh, the images for his films. Um, some, some components of uh, Shinkai's aesthetic are that he um, uses photographs as bases. So he, so be, a, a comment that's often made about uh, Shinkai films um, is well why not just do these live action because they are set in real places have a realistic uh take to them and are literally drawing over photographs of real places um but as you'll see there's what shinkai does could only be done in animation uh because he uses those bases and then he brings all of the imaginative uh aspects and control that animation gives to a director that no other medium could. He also likes to focus on landscapes, sky, clouds, sunsets, backlighting, uh, trains as a metaphoric component. Um, uh, he has control over color in a way that most other films haven't, don't. Um, uh, s modern films use this a little, uh, a lot more now that um, digital coloring has become a thing. I think one of the one of the breakthrough films was uh, Oh Brother Where Art Thou, which was the first one to use digital coloring, which is why everything is in a kind of yellowish sepia tone. Um, but animation automatically gives you that as a, as a control, but in much more detail. Um, so it allows him to represent the emotion of a scene in the colors and visuals of the scene. It, uh, it reminds me uh, a little bit of uh, Satoshi Kone, who specifically stated that he had no actual love for animation or anime but it allowed him to do uh, a lot of things that he wouldn't be able to accomplish in a live action format uh, and anybody who's seen Satoshi Kon's movies uh, i.e. Paprika uh, knows what that means and knows why he probably couldn't even come close to doing that yeah maybe if Kubrick was working in animation he would <laughs> he wouldn't have been so mean to his actors well well maybe <laughs> I guess that's what Miyazaki is. <laughs> that's a different. That's a different panel. Yeah, well, let's not open that up. Yeah, I have. I have a panel that discusses that at some length. But anyway, uh, we'll be talking about his full-length filmography, not including necessarily the shortest of short films that he's done, uh, such as the first few uh, films or for, first few short film projects he did, such as uh, Strain, uh, Stranger worlds or something like that and which was right before he did uh she and her cat 
mm. which was then in 2017 or 2018 yes. turned into a, a short five minute long five minute per episode anime series that had about i don't know six or seven episodes something like that yeah well he was doing a lot of um video game cgs and um uh music videos really uh in those in those early days short works yeah he he well when he was some of the projects he did independently were like she and her cat and then some at falcom i guess mm-hmm. he was doing uh he worked on things like f uh, fairy tale for two mm-hmm. uh, he did opening cinematics for that and a bunch of other games and if you go back and watch some of those opening theme songs every all most visual novels have that six minute long introductory cutscene or animation music video whatever you want to call it he had a uh <clears throat> definite signature style even back then that translated even over to his first work all right well let's let's talk a little bit about his early career then before we move on to his first work um so makoto shinkai is very interesting uh, as an artist because he was both very bold and very conservative in the way he approached art. Um, uh, in his early 20s, he was working um, at a video game company, uh, Falcom. So you know how in um, if you are picking up a Street Fighter game or any video game, and when you turn on the game, there's a cutscene that plays before you press start. Uh, he was making those in... Uh, in 3D CG, um, mostly, so he was familiar with that uh, for creating short works, short, punchy works. Um, and at some point, the grind of that kind of weighed on him, and he had some desires to be to become a real director. Um, but he he basically made a bet with himself. He said, "I'm going to quit my." Uh, nine to five paying job. Well, might have been longer hours than that. Uh, I'm going to quit my uh, regular paying job and be unemployed for uh, was it six months or a year? Yeah, I think it was about six months he uh, gave himself. Yeah. Um. And he basically said, "I'm going to be working on this on my own project, just making a." an entire film myself, and at the end of that, uh, I'll see how successful I was. If I was, if I completed a project and it's worked out, then I'm going to commit myself to a career of, of being an animation director. Um, and if not, it means that I don't have the chops uh, and I should fall back and get a, go, go back to a regular job. Um, and luckily for us, uh, he came through, uh, in a spectacular way. So let's move on to his first wor- first major work. Yeah, so Voices of a Distant Star was the, the first quote-unquote film, even though it clocks in at about 25 minutes yes. uh, in runtime. I believe it is 23 minutes, but you have to remember that yeah. this film, uh, from the, uh, visuals, the animation, the sound, and the voice acting is all entirely Makoto Shinkai except for the female voice, which was his girlfriend at the time. And music, which I believe he was working with Tenmon. Oh, um, he was, yes, he was already working with Tenmon. Um, That is a, this is um, a person he's collaborated with for music and shows up as the, uh, making the music for, I, is it still all of his films? No, it was everything up until uh, Garden of Words. Okay. Uh, I believe, and then he moved on. I think he had someone else for Garden of Words and then moved on to uh, Radwimps, for, obviously, for your right. name and, uh, uh, what's it called? About weathering with you. Yeah. So he has a few close people that he's used to working with, but the first thing you'll notice uh, is, is, like, oh, okay, this is a project that he had to make himself, but... Um, that doesn't change much as he goes on. He is a Makoto Shinkai is a man who likes to do almost everything himself, and uh, his career has been slowly learning to rely on others. So this was a this was a film that he premiered in two thousand two, and it won uh, two two award awards one in two thousand two, one in two thousand three, from 
some fairly prominent like animation awards uh, awards what is it called shows awards things and he uh it was a very obvious sign for him that his his first work had been successful and to honestly the the fact that he was able to accomplish all of this in six months is uh, impressive by itself given the scale of a 25 minute work that he basically mostly worked on 80 90 percent of entirely by himself and yeah i mean if you go back and watch it now it's quote unquote obvious that the work was done by one person it was choppy and rushed in some places but it's, i don't know i was thoroughly impressed when i saw it the first yeah, time yeah and for well the the problem just like with anything uh in retrospect is that you have his whole catalog to compare it to now <laughs> right and not even the fact that he's working with a new studio and he has people helping him just the fact that he has gotten better in almost all aspects of drawing mm. of uh, character yes. development of directing makoto shinkai is also really good with the short form you um he was doing um music videos and game cgs before um and even now, his uh, his movies often don't have tremendously long run times. Um, he's able to economize quite a bit. Like uh, Voices of a Distant Star, well, uh, I'd make a bet with most people that it'll it'll have more emotional impact on you than uh, most uh, two hour, two three hour movies. Um, his approach to uh, filmmaking is uh, I as we'll get to later, is very directly poetic in nature. Yeah, he, uh, to, I guess to get into this now, he did take a lot of inspiration from the author Haruki Murakami, who, if anybody has read any of Murakami's books, which he himself has a quite large catalog of books at this point, such as The Wind-Up Bird Chronicles, Kafka on the Shore, uh, After Midnight, uh, Killing Commendatore, he... Murakami has pretty much mastered that kind of ethereal, uh, fleeting, poetic uh, ver vision that Shinkai draws so much inspiration from. And Shinkai's themes and his general structure around how he builds a movie is very apparent within Voices of a Distant Star already. He's not a director that branches out very often, which we'll get to later on, but he he knows his strike zone and he knows his strong suits pretty well and even in his latest works he's kind of returning to those strong suits although i think there's some talk of him branching out again in his later later films um all right we've been jumping around a bit but let's uh voices of a distant star premise um a uh Makoto Shinkai loves himself sci-fi and romance, um, and blending those two together um, through themes of communication. Uh, Voices of a Distant Star is about a young girl who has to fly to space on a mech to fight some unclear war on a far-off planet on, like, Saturn or Jupiter uh, to defend Earth, um, possibly farther out. And as she travels at um, uh, light speeds... I guess. Um, she just travels light years away, She travels light years away. Um, well, no, because she is traveling at higher speeds because um, the kind of parallel is that she has only a cell phone with, with which to communicate to her middle school uh, love um, through text, and she is fighting in this far-off space, and he is continuing to age at a normal pace, whereas she is still essentially experiencing compressed time yeah so uh also hello overhaul it's nice to see more people yeah. joining uh the idea the the interesting thing that presents itself here is shinkai's first approach to mm -hmm. making communication a barrier uh it, that's something to overcome uh, one of his early observations on movie genres such as romance was well if these characters could just communicate if they had a cell phone or something or whatever there would be a lot of headache and a lot of issues resolved very quickly so in shinkai's works he looks to 
subvert that by putting up fairly hard to surpass barriers such as a gigantic distance between mm -hmm. two characters that is not only physical but also metaphorical in nature as mm -hmm. the, the the further the distance physically gets they get apart from each other the further the metaphorical distance would meaning their age and their emotional states get away from each other and because the cell phone can only travel at the speed of uh what was well, it? no, it does travel at light speed. Yeah, but she at some point later on, she's already uh, weeks, months, years away from him, and mm -hmm. every message takes longer that longer. amount of time. Yep. So let's talk about this image here, um, and about how a little bit about how Makoto Shinkai creates an image. So a few a few composition notes you'll notice. Uh, he he has a sci-fi element, a Big Mac but on a beautiful landscape with uh, environmental effects going on. And that is because um, he's drawing digitally, so he's able to draw in layers. Um, so unlike traditional animation where, well, traditional animation is able to do that by making background and then cells that you put over top for animation, um, digitally you're able to control that with even more layers. Um, to add layers to the background for um, for the scene, um, uh, things for the foreground, uh, characters in front, environmental effects, um, uh, even ahead of that, um, and he's able to control the palette he's paint uh, he's drawing with from the beginning. So that allows him to um, choose the palette for the scene and not have the characters mismatched from the background. Uh, so here you can see that he's got environmental effects running up front um, to create this very striking sun shower with a lens flare effect uh, for full J.J. Abrams uh, sci-fi reference here. Yeah, a lot of lens flare. And for the for the chat as well, I see there's some more uh, chat. Mm -hmm. we'll, uh, we'll address questions regarding Makoto Shinkai, and then after the panel we'll have a more general discussion if that's... Uh, if oh, that's yeah. what people want. If but... there's something that comes up, uh, feel, th feel free to throw it in chat. Like, uh, I'd be happy to, you know, we'd be happy to take a quick dive into some of those things. Yeah. Uh, and then, so, to, to end off on Voices of a Distance Star, it's, this is the, this also sets the tone for Shinkai's, like, melancholic storytelling endings, which, for newer viewers, they actually might not be as familiar with <clears throat> given that your name and weathering with you have ended on mostly positive notes yep more or less uh, but there is a strong strong tinge of melancholy in Shin Kai's early stuff because he didn't want he was sick he didn't think that people learned any lessons from happy endings which yep. obviously he's shifted his opinion on a little bit yeah um well we could get to that as we talk about our next film um uh, the place promised in our early days. Um, like uh, Cole was saying, there is a... Makoto Shinkai has a moral play um, approach to making a film in that uh, the purpose of a film to him is, uh, is not to just be entertainment, it's to, it's to teach... Um, it's to teach a lesson to the audience. So usually the thing that teaches the largest lesson is something where the ending is um, a little unpleasant. Um, so this one, I think, ostensibly has a, a happier ending, um, but it definitely shows you what it, uh, the sad part in between. Uh, premise for the place, place promised in our early days. Uh, it's a bit of a sci-fi Cold War um, the Russia's uh, the USSR is still um, active and has control of Hokkaido and the strait between Hokkaido and the uh, main island of Japan is a highly militarized zone. We have three um, high school students who have dreams of aviation. Um, two boys and a girl. They are in a love triangle, um, and they are unable to kind of do anything about this because of the weird kind of standoff of the love triangle sci-fi plots take over to have the girl transported to another dimension 
incidentally as part of a sci-fi experiment and the boys then have to work together to fly into the militarized zone into a extra dimensional tower to try and get her back yeah this is this is one of those films that shinkai's flaws start uh, appearing bit by bit first of all the plot is extremely hard to follow on something like a casual or initial watch through without some kind of supplemental material like a wikipedia article or something like that second of all the characters while there is a lot of emphasis on character relationships in the uh, movie the character personalities themselves which has been a main criticism of shinkai up until about your name and well i guess and up until the garden of words or so when he started to get a little bit better bit by bit they are almost kind of sort of like blank slates and now i'm not saying that this movie is not worth a watch it is definitely worth a watch especially oh. because it is his first feature length film that he worked on with a actual team behind mm -hmm. him so the evolution is very apparent, especially if you're just going straight from Voices of a Distant Star to The Place Promised in our early days. There is a lot to be gained from seeing mm -hmm. how Shinkai has improved his craft immensely in yeah. just a few years. I can see that argument that the characters are a little more, little more like Greek archetypes at a play than they are kind of fully realized characters, but the kind of definitely serves the function of the story and uh, gets across the emotion and he communicates so much through his visuals um, let's move on to the next um, so as you can see from the visuals here um, he has a, he he's a, he interjects metaphor into his shots um, that big vertical line in the distance is a um, kind of extra dimensional tower that the Soviet Union is building um uh science stuff happens there yeah it's, uh, it's but it's also representative of the distance that they have to travel to get to their to their goals um because it is they can see it but it's not a thing they can get to easily um so in this shot even while they're young it foreshadows that the characters are slowly walking towards that that uh, kind of goal or destiny um, through this kind of blue sky. Yeah, in, in the, the foreground, uh, mi middle ground, background, Shinkai is very, very good already at communicating extremely close and extremely far distances mm -hmm. as it looks like the train tracks are almost coming out of the mm -hmm. screen towards the, towards the viewer. And it, much much more polished look, not just in image quality but just in the crispness of the image and the the colors used it, and this is also like alan said indicative of his love of sci-fi which he has pretty much the traditional sci-fi author influences like asimov and all of that mm. stuff and that i think that that kind of stuff fascinates him but he mostly uses it as set pieces or settings and voices of a distant star it was a very convenient way for him to uh, put a lot of distance between his characters mm -hmm. and in in place promised in our early days it's a way for him to play around with a uh, i guess mm -hmm. a alternate history of mm -hmm. japan that he can he can construct the plot around to say there is this MacGuffin in the world that mm. they need to reach for X Y Z reason. It is, it is a rough plot structure, but the plot structure is there mm -hmm. and it's it's being improved upon. It's uh, it's uh, Makoto Shinkai uh, very much appeals to me because he has a lot of um, long atmospheric shots. Uh, this is one of the you'll see. Um, well, he says he's not a train otaku. This is the fir first uh, time we're seeing train tracks. He likes uh, trains as a metaphor for communication. Uh, we'll be moving, let's move on to five centimeters per second. Um, and before Cole tears off, <laughs> this is uh, your favorite film, right? Yeah, this is this is my favorite Shinkai um, film. I'm going to take a second and talk about um, uh, Shinkai's um, move from niche to popular and uh, 
I will use this as an example of moving uh, somewhere in between. So his first two works are kind of sci-fi otaku romance things blended together. Five centimeters per second doesn't really have any uh, sci-fi elements to it. Um, so it is able to reach a broader Japanese audience, but it is also wasn't um, didn't make as big a splash in, in overseas markets because it is a thoroughly Japanese work. Um, it is unlike uh, his more recent films, which are much more easily accessible by anybody. Um, five centimeters per second. Uh, is kind of steeped in Japanese poetry to begin with, so I'll let you kind of tear off on the premise of Five Centimeters Per Second and Murakami. Uh, so, the so despite it not making as big of a splash overseas, I think the opposite is also true. Where it Shinkai was surprised at all that any overseas viewers were a fan of it. This is. In a world where your name never came out, this would have been Shin or Shinkai's best work, probably most well-known work anyway. And he really, really, really cranks up the the feeling of uh, melancholy, uh, bittersweetness, so on and so forth. And there, there is a there's a pretty good Murakami, Haruki Murakami short story about the, the perfect girl that uh, passes him on the street one day, and Murakami's point of view is, I, I could say anything to her, I could say hi, it could lead to us getting to know each other, it could lead to us having the same interests, and it could lead to us having the perfect life together, but in the end he never says hi, and he just passes by her and he keeps on walking, which for anybody who's familiar with 5 centimeters per second knows that there is a scene that parallels this pretty closely not a hundred percent to a t but it parallels the ending parallels this scene pretty well and also this is a little bit of a late introduction but there are some spoilers to these films in here <laughs> but with shinkai the it's definitely more about the journey than it is the destination as as such yeah i wouldn't say that they're thoroughly plot intensive films like uh like a lot of good films um uh i like him because and i'm biased towards atmospheric films you could usually sum summarize the plot of these films in a couple sentences there's a lot of sci-fi elements in the background but you i'm not super big into sci-fi so but it didn't diminish my appreciation of any of these films um because i was highly invested in the kind of emotional drama that was playing out on screen uh so five centimeters per second um yeah there's a uh it it's very it's interesting because it also occurs in a very distinct three act structure um that time skips so there's a, a first act where he is in um elementary school or middle school and has a a girlfriend um and but he's unable to kind of get together with her because he has to move away then he experiences like uh, like high school years, um, but he's unable to uh, find love that's in front of him because um, uh, he's still obsessed with this uh, lost love from his youth. Then you see him as an adult, and he finally reaches out to that girl from elementary school, um, and she's married and like has a kid and has moved on, and he's just kind of alone because he never acted upon any of these things and let longing for something that never was prevent him from uh, seizing on the opportunities for happiness and love that were presenting themselves to him. If I'm not remembering correctly, he doesn't actually ever contact her. We just, as the viewer, we see the dramatic irony that she has moved on. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, so oh, wow, he doesn't even take that step. I I do remember the kind of shot and the song playing over top. Yeah, I don't think, I, if I'm remembering correctly, he doesn't actually ever get that closure besides the train crossing scene, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I guess, more or less closure. So this is another example where Murakami and Shinkai kind of parallel each other. This, this film is much more grounded in reality with very, very few instances of uh, 
well, there's fantasy. No, there's no sci-fi aspects in here at all. There, there are some uh, dream sequences where they are on that remote planet, looking at the two, the two planets orbiting, two suns orbiting, which sure, is like sure, sure, it's a little metaphorical. Yeah, it's like it, it's like slightly elevated beyond total reality, but it's mostly still based in reality. Mm -hmm. uh, Murakami likes to do that too with a lot of his books. Some bo some of his books are completely fantasy based and completely out there. So you got Others, pretty deep into Murakami. Yeah, I've I've read almost like. Probably sixty to seventy. What is the author's full name again? Haruki Murakami. Haruki Murakami. If anybody wants to, yeah, dive into that, can you find his stuff translated into English? Yeah, yeah, it's all translated. He's he's not he's not under the radar. He's pretty okay. well known at this point. Um, and so Shinkai, this this is a work that's that's pretty strictly grounded in reality, and this three act structure was actually intended to be viewed in three separate parts. So you would watch a quote-unquote episode, mm -hmm. uh, take a break for a little bit, watch episode two, and then mm -hmm. episode three. Yeah, it's uh, one of his longer films, isn't it? No. This is 60-ish mm. minutes. Right. Uh, I think the first time I saw it, I remember that it was a short run time, but it felt a lot yeah. longer. And that's... that's I, I do I do know a lot of people who have watched this, and it, it does feel very long uh, because of the way that the 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 story is played out. Yeah, because of the way he composes shots, there's a lot of gravity to every scene and every shot. So you feel a little emotionally exhausted yeah. after each one. So if you want to, like, you know, take a water break yeah, uh, and come back, uh, I wouldn't blame you. Um, it's kind of, it's a little bit intended to be viewed that way. Let's move on to some of the technical things and the images. Um, so, again, shot composition here. Um... This is the childhood romance of our characters. Um, this is a real street. Um, this is based off a photo and then drawn over top. There's no part of the original photo in here, uh, but it has been drawn over top of. But what that allows you him to do is allows him to palette all of the colors together. So you can see that... Um, the colors uh, on the characters match the cherry blossom colors in the background, and because this is a shot of youthful love, um, it has a lot of very warm tones to it that really uh, get across the feeling of uh, what the scene is supposed to communicate. Uh, it's called, uh, I believe it's called temperature in color. So even if you didn't have anything explained about what this shot was, uh, or, or didn't know what movie it's from. If you saw this shot, uh, if you showed this to anybody, you'd pro they'd probably be like, "Oh, these are some young ch children who are in love with each other," um, and you would be able to get that. It allows him to add the cherry blossoms falling um, and give it a whole lot of depth. Uh, also, um, it allows him to control the light source. Um, uh, one of the reasons to sh uh, d operate in animation, but off. A picture of a real place is uh, live action directors often spend thousands of dollars trying to get shots at precisely the right time of day um, there's something called golden hour where uh, between uh, day and dusk uh, in the kind of dusk time where shots look really good and you can spend a lot of money trying to get a shot there and if you don't get it in the in that take well you have to wait a whole day and come back the next day um, Makoto Shinkai can take a picture of a landscape, and there's no such thing as a lit, as a, as delaying uh, a shoot because of rain or waiting for it to rain so that you can get a shot. Um, he has control of the light source of where the sun is of what the the weather is because it's animation. But he has a very real place to put these things on top of. Let's move to the next shot. This is uh, one of his uh, more better. Uh, you have the more. Um, yeah, uh, I also don't... Have you mentioned the fact that he uses real locations? Yes. Okay. Also, uh, let me uh, let me talk about how much uh, he uses real locations. Two, he has a, a small team that he uses to um, before every movie. He takes uh, about... I believe they take about like 3,000 to 6,000 photographs of the locations that they will be including in their film... Uh, before they even begin production on the film, because 
this is what they're going to be using as a base for a lot of their for a lot of their shots. Plan uh, there's first is storyboarding, that is sh um, then uh, there's photo collection. Um, so if you want to travel to any of the you could go to any of the places that are in Makoto Shinkai films. Even though there's a lot of sci fi elements, they are uh, all in specific places. So like the um, uh, place promised in your early days it takes place in a town at the north of the main island of J Japan just before you cross to Hokkaido. It occurs at that strait. Um, a lot of these things take place in Tokyo. Um, and as you'll see going forward, um, Makoto Shinkai loves landscapes but also loves the beauty of the city. Most people will are able to, like Miyazaki and a lot of other, and a lot of classical artists, will find the beauty in landscape shots of great mountain ranges, wild forests, but Koto Shinkai finds the beauty in cities. Um, uh, he loves uh, he loves the shots of uh, a city at dawn, of, of Tokyo at dawn, of Tokyo in the rain, and he includes that in his films. As in, I will often be watching his films, and um, there's a... I find the air just kind of escape my chest as I see some of these shots, and I'm just like have my breath taken away where I just kind of go, uh. <laughs> So this is one of the more metaphorical shots in the, in um, five centimeters per second. This is in that uh, middle um, section where um, the girl on the left uh, has been wanting to get together with uh, the our main character, the boy on the right, and they've just watched a, but as they are, they had a scene where she confessed to him, uh, and he just kind of declined. It was there, behind them. <laughs> there was a shot of a um, rocket taking off into no. space. Wrong, wrong scene. Oh, this I'm is, sorry. This is the scene of his childhood crush, uh, and they are in the otherworldly. Uh, oh, this setting. is the metaphorical yeah, scene. Yeah, this is the this is the metaphorical setting where uh, they actually it is interesting to me it hasn't occurred to, to me before but this is probably one of his first uses of liminal space as well mm -hmm. uh this is a much more mm -hmm. extreme version of liminal yeah. space where it is literally these two people are the only ones on this planet and that has its own metaphorical implications like mm -hmm. he he's he's so obsessed with her that she he, she is the only one that he sees or considers or perceives and it ends it, it creates this scenario in his mind and mm -hmm. his dreams where he's the only one with her on this planet yeah uh, so let's talk a little a little briefly about the uh so again messing scene and and metaphor in his shots there's the confession scene uh a separate scene where the girl confesses to him and there's a rocket ship taking off uh behind them which is like you know they're in the location that they are at there is a they are near i think where where jackson launches rockets but it's also a metaphor for them speeding away from each other um, uh, at great speeds. Um, and then this is kind of, this scene takes place afterwards um, as a metaphor to show that he is still thinking about this other girl in this liminal space, but they're facing away from each other um, as kind of space is being able to be seen through the sky in the background um, to show that Although they are thinking about, although he's thinking about her, they are as far as away from each other as the cold distances of space. Again, could compare this to the last shot where the colors were very warm and could clearly tell that the uh, characters were in love. Here you see a lot of cool tones um, that get across the idea that um, there's there's a frigidity here, that there's an isolation, that they are far away from each other, but it's still a stunningly beautiful scene. Again, cloud, sky, Makoto Shinkai loves these things. Yeah, and there's a there's there's a lot more we could go on yeah. on and on and on about well, we got that. A truck here. Yeah, and uh, there's there's what's it called? This is the first use as well where he uses the the music video ending, uh, which isn't mm. isn't removed from his films now, which just located in different places like Rad Wimps and Your Name and mm -hmm. Weathering with You, they just have montages at certain points throughout mm -hmm. the movie instead of specifically on the ending but he did use a traditional japanese song sung by a traditional by the the original artist which mm -hmm. has a very 80s sound to it which uh, 
ties back into it being a Japanese movie, a very Japanese in concept movie. But anyway, uh, we'll move on to the the uh, the black sheep of the filmography. Yes. All right, um, Children Who Chase Lost Voices. This is um, so after five centimeters per second. Um, uh, again, a little more about uh, Makoto Shinkai's kind of uh, bio here. Um, Makoto Shinkai, as he, with um, his first major film, um, The Place Promised in the Early Days, um, he had started working with the team. Um, and it was a little shocking and jarring for Makoto Shinkai because he is used to doing everything himself. And if you'll notice in The Place Promised in his early days, He's still credited in most of the <laughs> in most of the uh, most of the credits. Like he was doing sound, he was doing so much. So his name just kind of keeps popping up. Although he had people to work with, he had a tendency to do most things himself. As he was going on, he had to slowly learn that he has a team of people supporting him, and that he can delegate work. Um, and it's kind of, it's just kind of a little touching how dedicated he is to his craft and how self-effacing and humble he is. Because his team started acting a little like a family or a parent to him. Because after five centimeters per second, um, kind of uh, made it fairly large in Japan and even made it overseas, um, despite Makoto Shinkai being kind of surprised that it would, because uh, he always underestimates his works. Um... His team told him that you're about to undertake a um, a large career in filmmaking. You will be busy for the rest of your life soon. Since this is your first major work and you are young, you should take a year and uh, get to enjoy your youth because you will soon be constantly working on projects. Uh, and so Makoto Shinkai took a trip to England for a year, and he worked with uh, animators uh, from across the world, and tried uh, specifically learning a lot about mythology from other places in the world besides Japan, and to broaden his horizons and get a break before coming back and doing another major work. So that's a heavy influence on Children Who Chase Lost Voices. Um, it's, you can see him making an attempt to get a broader appeal, and there's definitely a stab at being very Ghibli-esque here. Well, it's, it, that comes from mm -hmm. articles being written over and over again about asking if Shinkai is the next Hayao Miyazaki, yes. which is a bad comparison and shouldn't be yes. made, but, uh, it was made in uh, e even even up until your name and pa past your name. Mm -hmm. There were still journalists saying like, he's the next Shinkai and so, yeah. or the next uh, Miyazaki. Miyazaki. <laughs> but because that was that mm -hmm. comparison was heightened during your name because he had surpassed all of Miyazaki's previous works at that point, which was then retroactively uh, mm -hmm. spirited away one again. So this is a very much a grand adventure featuring a child as a main protagonist. Um, there's a grim adult. Um, so it, it has a lot of parallels to like uh, Castle in the Castle in the Sky. Um, but it is definitely still a, a Shinkai work. It's a little, it's a lot grimmer. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. Than most Ghibli works. There it, Somebody does die in the beginning, and this is essentially a a travel into the underworld myths of various um, cultures across the world, along with some interesting kind of conspiracy theories. And essentially, there's a story about confronting and accepting death. Uh, that's kind of the resolution, is not that you get the person back and save them from the underworld, it's that you accept that... They're supposed to be there, and you're not supposed to be there yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, so why don't you talk about all of the kind of myths well, that went into this? Yeah, I'm I'm still researching actually for a different panel uh, that the the journey to the center of the earth and Agartha, which is what this world is called in the film. Uh, Agartha is a pretty high concepts idea that a lot of cultures have. A lot of cultures and some religions, I think Agartha specifically comes from Buddhist religion about 
the the center of the earth and there being another there another world present in there uh you'll also see this in some conspiracy uh theories and in films such as even the latest godzilla they've made it canon in godzilla that the center of the earth is a real place and, and there is parallel i mean the center of the earth agartha whatever you call it is the same thing um mm -hmm. also this uh we we should rip the band-aid off right now and just say this is probably this is not a good film like if some I, I enjoyed it you you can enjoy it you can enjoy it for the visuals there are a lot of pretty visuals but like if you are watching this to have a appreciation for story characters whatever you're not going to be satisfied especially if you're comparing it to ghibli films yeah i'm not i'm not even sure this is great for children it's a little scare it's scarier than most ghibli films and ghibli films will still have ghibli films will still have that going on uh but <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of fun fun uh yeah. uh visuals from different cultures and different uh, it, it allows yep. it allows shinkai to flex his fantasy muscle yep. which he hasn't been able to do a lot because he's been mostly focused on sci-fi and tried to stay grounded in reality yeah um still a lot of the animation is incredible um there's a there's a scene that's just kind of apropos of nothing of some shadows coming out of a ruin to a, to attack our main characters as they're kind of on this grand journey through a fantastical land um uh but the kind of action of that shot was like uh was really amazing um doesn't really have much to do with the rest of the story it's just we're traveling across, and here are some trials as you go across your journey. Uh, also, I forgot to mention, even though we are running up against yeah. time, we still we have a 30-minute buffer, and yeah. you're the next panelist, so it doesn't, yeah. panel. yes. uh, it yeah. doesn't matter as much. Uh, yeah. So th there's your favorite yeah. shot. Uh, yes. Uh, this is just a lot of Makoto Shinkai-isms. Uh, so they travel through this underworld and find the place kind of where death is. And Makoto Shinkai loves uh, grand landscapes, uh, he loves shots of the sky, um, but he also needed to have a shot of this giant chasm in the underworld. Um, and he's like, well, this is a shot pointing down, and I love the sky and clouds. Well, how do I solve this? Why don't I put the sky in the hole? <laughs> yeah. And we so, haven't actually talked about his love of clouds very much. <laughs> I mean, there's not a whole lot to say, just that he loves, like, we've got sky, we've got clouds, and we've got lens flare. Yeah, well, trains. <laughs> Yes. Well, in this shot, we've got lens flare um, oh, and a shot. grand landscape. Um, these are just things that Makoto Shinkai loves, and well, I love to watch Makoto Shinkai do it. Uh, and we will, we won't, we won't go with super speed on these, yeah. but we will speed up like yes. a little bit. But because because yeah. we actually have done a whole panel on the garden. Of yes, Wars, it's so. it's how it's how I started. Um, this is my favorite work. Uh, its runtime is only a little over forty minutes. Um, uh, because your guy does tend to work pretty quickly because he does he doesn't feel a need for a film to linger longer than it needs to. Um, this is again a very grounded film. Entirely takes place in Tokyo in uh, real, real shots. Uh, primarily in uh, Tokyo Gyoen Park, uh, where our characters meet up. Um, this is Shinjuku Gyoen. Shinjuku Gyoen. Um. Uh, sorry if I butchered that. Um, uh, and this uh, is about a student and a teacher meeting and talking about poetry. Um, so again, it gets a gets. Well, I I don't have an under, I definitely do not have a depth of understanding of Japanese poetry. Um, I was able to still fall. I was I didn't lose a beat in the film because it's communicated so well through the visual medium so uh even if i didn't understand a whole lot about the depth of the poetry uh, i was able to understand the, po the poems by proxy because he is kind of filling in that understanding with shots that reinforce that and if you do know and appreciate uh japanese poetry you will get that much more out of it he he does like uh this is the film where he turns a lot of uh traditional filmmaking like uh, stereotypes on their heads 
uh, where student and teacher mm -hmm. the concept is flipped where the student is the quote unquote more mature one mm -hmm. the rain being present yes. here is not seen as as sad it's being seen as happy oh like premise um here we have a student uh, who is considering job dropping out of school but is doing very well in school he has a clear goal for his life he wants to become a cobbler a cobbler <laughs> a, shoemaker a person who makes shoes um he uh i believe his uh his uh parents have passed uh he grew to he got he fell in love with shoes because um he uh used to see his mother like working on on her feet and wanted to make shoes for her uh he has an older brother but he takes care of himself and helps take care of his family um and is a very responsible adult with a clear goal uh, to move to move towards the teacher in this respect is and they don't actually know that they go to the same school at first or who each other is um, is uh, having trouble at her job as slowly revealed throughout her film uh, is unclear about her direction or what whether she wants to continue on this path um, and this makes use of a very of a liminal space through environment. Uh, it has a lot of beautiful shots of Tokyo, but the way these characters happen to meet, run into each other is they meet in Tokyo Gowen Park under an awning uh, right there um, uh, when it rains because they just both have the compulsion that when it rains they feel like taking a day off going to school. Um, they use it as an excuse to avoid those specific responsibilities for the day. Um, and they will go and often read poetry in the park. Um, they meet each other there not knowing who each other are and begin kind of sharing um, bits of their lives uh, about each other and developing a kind of understated romance, a very Japanese understated romance. It's never ex explicitly called out that they are uh, in love with each other, but you definitely get that sensibility uh, about it. Well, it is called it. Takao does straight up confess to Yukari in the mm. last part of the film. Uh, sure, but it's also kind of a, a goodbye. Um, yeah, and also, uh, they aren't necessarily just strictly discussing poetry. They're just using the rain as mm. an excuse to go like hang out at the park. They're, yes. The, the Manyo Shu is like a backdrop to the, to the overall themes mm -hmm. of... Uh, of Garden of Words, but it is not the main focus. They themselves have kind of premised their own meeting <laughs> yeah. in a bit of this uh, uh, meta dialogue because they kind of talked with each other like, hey, we can't do this every day, but how about whenever it rains, we'll show up. Um, and that continues happening for a while, and there is a break where one of them isn't showing up and they're unsure about whether this is going to continue. Um... Uh, the the teacher has a habit of eating chocolate and it has a lot of childish um, aspects. Uh, he makes shoes for her, uh, which is a, also like which there's is, also definitely some foot shots. He's not but, a he's not a Tar he's not a Tarantino. Yeah, uh, but uh, it definitely is in there. Well, it's it's also just a that's like a, a implicit like confession, mm -hmm. uh, especially when they're having like him putting yes. the shoes on her of like. The, mm -hmm. there's something there there's there's a depth here because there's also a parallel drawn between he wanted to have made shoes for his mother um man that gets creepy actually, i'm not even sure his mother is <laughs> dead i think they might just parents might just be divorced i forget uh, um but but so, there's there's a complexity to their relationship which has some aspects there's and at the end uh you have a shot where they finally meet and they reconcile their emotions for each other and kind of grounded in, we understand what we mean to each other and how it helped us grow. Um, uh, probably more for the older person than it is for the younger person, that she is now, uh, has a perspective on what she wants to do, is able to get past the trials that were secretly in the background for her career, and is able to kind of move towards that, and they can kind of separate from each other because they have grown from their relationship. And at that point, the kind of liminal space is dramatically uh, broken as the as the sun uh, cascades through the rain, and it becomes a sun shower. 
and they are now kind of released from their kind of bond in the liminal space. And it's kind of assumed that they don't really see each other because they're this isn't a relationship that would work romantically, if it even was exactly that. Um, but they are both happy for having known each other and have grown from it. Yeah, uh, and this this is this is I'm not uh, I'm not a subs versus dub guy anymore really, but the uh, the voice acting by uh, Miyu I- Irino and uh, Hana Kanazawa, mm-hmm. Kana Hanazawa mm-hmm. just incredibly dwarfs yeah. the English voice acting because they have Hanakana. the well it's not just Hanakana it's yeah. the fact <laughs> that they have to convey like five different emotional states in their voice in one line in the delivery. And it's not it's not just sad, it's not just happiness, it's not just anger, yeah. it's not just regret, it's everything yes. has to come out at the same time. And even the ma- the male character, mm-hmm. uh, Takao, he can't just be angry with her because he still loves her, mm-hmm. he's still happy for her, he knows it's the right yeah. thing for her. So he has to convey they both have to convey mm-hmm. all of that emotion. And that this is like the climactic scene. Yes. And if she you screw up if you screw up the voice acting here, it's like all for naught. Shinkai's able to bring it all together. He doesn't need a whole lot of time. He has put in 40 minutes of building you uh, with a slow tension up to this final scene where the voice acting uh, comes together as they meet, the sun breaks through the clouds, and the score dramatically bursts in, uh, bringing the swelling of emotion that uh, if you don't have some heart palpitations at this, well, you may not have a heart. <laughs> this is a, this is another scene where they use the musical ending, yep. uh, Rain, uh, which is a classical song, or not a classical song, a, a older song, but mm-hmm. it's sung by a modern artist this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, which... Something that will uh, convey some nostalgia if you have any experience with movies, from, uh, with music from the late 80s and 90s, which... Um, he, he he brings a lot of his personal stuff in, and it communicates, which is why... An, another reason why he's done so well with Japanese audiences is that it loses a little in communication for uh, people overseas, but it would be kind of like... Uh, but if you are Japanese and you would experience that at the time, this it wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to not affect you. So, so we'll move on to the one that everybody knows yeah. at this point, is uh, Your Name, uh, 2016... Uh, obviously the biggest the biggest he's ever got mm-hmm. potentially the biggest he'll ever get uh it was a it, it seemed to be a perfect storm uh which i guess shinkai just doesn't like he doesn't he doesn't like that this movie made so much money he doesn't like that so many people saw it there were a lot of <laughs> interviews with him just saying stop seeing my movie please that's that's just because he's so humble and he was like wait a second my movie is doing better than spirited away it's doing better than any other like it's doing better than all of these other films, and he's like, "But I don't deserve to be better than." No, those it wasn't. People. It wasn't that he didn't deserve it. He felt like this film didn't deserve it. He's like, <laughs> yeah. "This is like a body swap, like romantic, goofy anime yeah. show." Shinkai is a very workman sort of director. Once he's finished with the film, he's always looking at it and being like, "Well, I could have improved this. I could have improved oh, this. Yeah. I could have improved this." <laughs> like, uh, and the, the we don't need to explain your name in detail as much. There mm-hmm. is. Uh, the the pre- the premise is uh, two teenagers have a body swapping experience where one of them is living in a rural area and one of them is living in a uh, city and it is a experience where they they both live each other's lives and uh, understand each other's perspective a little bit better and the uh, I won't I won't spoil this one because this is the one that mm. a lot of people would probably yeah. want to see and... the plot matters a little more for this one but there's uh, a lot of Freaky Friday aspects as a boy is put into a girl's body and a girl is put into a boy's body um, and they get to experience each other's lives um, uh, what is the 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 classic play with the popper and the prince um, there's a bit of that going on as oh. they uh, I'd be a prince of the pauper. Um, as um, the rural person who uh, fantasized about a city life, uh, the rural girl who fantasized about a city life gets to see what that's like. The uh, the boy who was just uh, wanted to experience a little bit of a slower pace gets to experience that. And there's a lot of uh, comedy uh, and indirect romance ensues because they, although they swap bodies with each other, uh, this is just early premise. Um, they never actually remember it. It's a bit of a haze to them whenever they wake up and return to their own bodies. 
but be, they are writing in journals for each other, uh, so they are communicating through each other indirectly and making agreements with each other about, well, here are the ground rules when you're in my body. <laughs> yeah, know? a lot of uh, this is this is the first one, which strangely enough might attribute it to more success where he like went in a more dramatically anime style yes there's a lot more comedy um slapstick slapstick they are of of gender swapping uh and the hilarity that will ensue from that well there's the designs too yeah uh he switched he 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 used the new character designer uh and a new band for this as well yep. uh the band in this sense rad williams is now where he's gone from like classical or older music and using an older artist to using older music and a newer artist. Now it's just new music, new artists yes. specifically for this film. I'm, I'm very sad that I've never had a McDonald's burger that looks like the ones <laughs> in this oh, yeah. film. Yeah. This is this is the most dramatic and most dramatic and heart filling uh, Big Mac you will ever see. <laughs> it uh, is so plump. <laughs> then there, there, there is, the, there is like the some elements uh, where he dips his toes back mm -hmm. into fantasy, like mm -hmm. on on a first watch, like, well, if you if you like critically analyze this movie, there are a lot of things that just don't make sense. But Shinkai's like power in this film is that he, he you don't, you don't notice that on a first watch yeah. if you're not watching it with a critical eye. If you're just yeah. watching it to for the enjoyment, you don't notice what's mm -hmm. what's like that. None of this makes any sense. I'm easily carried along, so yeah. I was just invested in the uh, in the characters and uh, their struggles, um, and even the B plots as they come up, uh, like uh, with the with the kids in town. Um, so you might get a little fridge logic afterwards, but like uh, it just it just did it occur to me. I was swept along for the for the entire for the entire thing. And uh, just to, to talk about it a little bit, uh, obviously, I mean, your name also did the important thing of establishing the Makoto Shinkai cinematic universe because Yukari does show mm -hmm. up as a teacher in the school uh, mm -hmm. that the main character, well, that uh, the male character, I believe, is a part of. Mm -hmm. And then Weathering with You also has cameos by uh, the your name characters. Mm -hmm. So now it's established that they're all taking place in the same universe. I doubt there's going to be some kind of like Avengers like crossover, but we'll see. I guess. Uh, so weathering with you, in my opinion, was definitely studios pressuring Shin Kai to make another film as quickly as possible to capitalize off the success of Your Name. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that Shin Kai also the first one to have a very clearly uh, happy ending. Yeah, Your no, Name. No bittersweetness here. Yeah, there is there is very. I mean, not like a hundred percent happy, but more like happy. Also, the uh, the teacher from Guarded for Words makes a cameo in in uh, in Your Name. That's what I just said. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, the uh, so weathering with you is like very much like I don't I don't I don't want to say that Shinkai ever half asses a film, uh, but. It does feel like he was just trying to come out with something, and there was themes of like, uh, while while in your name it was very much more emotion, uh, uh, heavily invested in like natural disasters, which play into the f plot of the film. Mm -hmm. Weathering with you also follows up on that a little bit. It's about a girl who can control the weather, and make it stop raining, uh, which is a pretty funny contrast from the Garden of Words, uh, which. It, shows that he still likes to use weather as a motif and uh, the main character uh, forms a business with her oh, to do all that stuff the animation of water yeah oh yeah <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of water animation like uh, so Makoto Shinkai has created his own uh, by this point has uh, uh, well a couple of films ago has created his own um, uh, animation studio Comics wave. Uh, comics wave, and he's taught his style to to others. Um, so other people are learning the techniques that he's kind of uh, forefronted. And a lot of times he'll just have them flex, like they've taken some contracts to do just the most the most inspirational advertisement for a bridge construction in Thailand mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you'll see, and um, the charter school or the the, the school. Yes, the Z Kai. I, I, after, it was a commercial for a cram school, and people yeah. saw this commercial and were like, were like, this is a trailer, right? When's the movie going to come out? <laughs> and then th it was kind of ironic because your name was basically that version. Yes. Was, 
Uh, so, like... Uh, the water is just him flexing at this point. Yeah, so... In order to uh, wrap up a little bit uh, and to potentially answer any questions that anybody has, uh, the future is uh, definitely definitely bright for Shinkai. He's only 48 years old, and mm-hmm. given given Miyazaki's age and uh, the fact that Miyazaki's still working, mm-hmm. it's a pretty good sign that Shinkai has at least 20, 25, yes. 30 years. And over the course of his work, he's de- he's continued to grow as a director with every film. Um, like... Everything, every film has added, added e- in either new um, animation and uh, and creation techniques, or he's learned how to delegate more to his company, and he's successfully taught a lot of people uh, to animate in his mold. So while I expect that he'll still wa- have an urge to be involved in all the things that he can be, uh, he's definitely learned to delegate, which means that he can guide projects and grow new animators um so i i could see um comics wave at some point uh, as he takes on projects if the if the studio continues to grow maybe be do, doing projects under other directors uh and his he we do have some inclination of his next film which seems to be obviously he likes using real world events as inspiration so he's Potentially going to make a film uh, paralleling the COVID crisis uh, mm-hmm. in in 2022 2023 time frame. Mm-hmm. I, I he, we definitely know he's working on it. We don't know when exactly <coughs> it's coming out though. Uh, but I, I believe that about <coughs> wraps up the panel. Uh, yep. We've got a little bit over. We had some difficulty at the beginning there. But uh, it, does anybody in the chat have any questions? Uh, if not, we'll just. Uh, Alan's actually yeah. doing the Does next panel. Does anybody here have any questions? Yeah. We have a little bit of an audience yeah. here. Yeah. And Alan's doing the next yeah. panel too. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, with that, I think we've uh, we've covered just about everything we wanted yeah. to hit. I have a question. Yes. Well, um, what do you see, do? You see a trajectory in Makoto Shinkai's films, like he? he yes. Yeah, okay. In in many ways, mm-hmm. uh, I think for me to start, I'd say that. Um, with your name, there was a break into understanding uh, making films for other people. Oh, okay. Um, mm-hmm. Before this, like, I'm a little bit of a hipster. I grew- <laughs> glommed on to uh, Makoto Shinkai because of how much of an auteur he was yeah. and how much he le- leaned into things that I wasn't familiar with, like mm-hmm. Japanese poetry, yep. uh, and making films in a different way. Mm-hmm. With your name, he made something that was very much a blockbuster. Mm-hmm. Um, and it it's the reason they took off across the world is because it was so accessible, mm-hmm. such a kind of elemental form of storytelling, yeah. um, with ways to reach out to other people. And he was able to give it a happy ending, which he, as we mentioned before, he was loath to do before. Yeah. Cause he was like, how will people learn anything? <laughs> <laughs> These characters are, yeah. uh, have a happy ending, exactly. but he figures if he can draw it out just enough, you can mm-hmm. see. Yeah. Uh, what would have happened had they had they made mistakes along the way? Uh, uh, how about for you? It's hard to say. Like he definitely jumped to out of his comfort zone with Children of Jay's Lost Voices, but he was kind of mm-hmm. beat back into his comfort zone yes. <laughs> in the, within the next movie. Mm-hmm. So like, it, it's it's hard to say if like, it, or is he going to keep going with this character animator and Rad Wimps, or is mm-hmm. he going to jump to something else completely? Will he yeah. stay with the romantic drama, romantic mm-hmm. comedy genre? Mm-hmm. Will he jump to? Will he try his hand at something else? Uh, like, I, I, selfishly, I wouldn't want him to just make a film about like the COVID crisis and two teenage characters <laughs> yes. that love each other. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. I, I, I think mm-hmm. he, he, he has, he has the ability to grow past like just what Shinkai does. Yes. I wouldn't say that he's a filmmaker that takes wild swings in different directions. There sure. are directors who do do that. Mm-hmm. Um, in the same way that he have entered filmmaking in such a, <laughs> such a specifically conservative and controlled manner of like, well, the real world is the real world and I need to feed myself. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to take a shot at this and if it doesn't work out, then that means that um, well, I need to be able to feed myself and I have to get a real job again. Mm-hmm. When he takes these uh, swings like uh, with uh, children, uh, 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 voices from deep below, um, and um, 
and your name, mm-hmm. he takes them with what he's good at mm-hmm. as a base. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's still very recognizably Shinkai, mm-hmm. uh, just with some of the things tweaked yeah. here and there. And you can tell that he's working with his team, so mm-hmm. it's not unconsidered. Yeah. They're, he's working with other people to make these moves. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we're up against time, so cool. I'm Justin. Uh, we'll be right back shortly. Well, he'll be right back. <laughs> well, you'll you'll be in here too. We'll have it. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk around. about it. No okay. worries. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. We're going to switch over. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm going to switch over to some uh, some other video, and uh, we'll be right back in a little bit.